Welcome to another Business Spotlight, where we share insights, reflections, and pearls of wisdom from local business owners. My name is Kerry James. I'm a business coach and a facilitator. And on today's Business Spotlight, I'm delighted to welcome Dr. Devon Moodley, CEO of Equilibrium Healthcare and founder of Health Connect. Good afternoon to you, Devon, and welcome to Business Spotlight. Good afternoon, Kerry, and uh, thank you very much for having me on. Pleasure and privilege to be here. Yeah, you, you're, you're very welcome. So let's explore a little bit. There's a few clues in the titles of your uh, your businesses, uh, Devon. But how long have you been in business, please? And what sort of areas do you specialise in? There's two main aspects, and it's been over the last, uh, well, I've been in healthcare for decades. So that's my 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 primary background and at C-suite level. I was doctor office group medical director and then did the management of healthcare companies for a while. And then about four or five years ago, we really got into tech. And that's what has made a huge difference in terms of how we've been able to produce the output. So we've been uh, producing, you've probably seen, we've had several outstanding ratings in our healthcare facilities. And it's about merging the two um, because healthcare and tech are no longer mutually exclusive terms. You know, it's if you're a healthcare business, you need to be a tech business as well. Okay. And so... Maybe an example to bring that to life would be used to, useful, Devon. And, and who would be a typical client for you? Would it would it be public service side of thing? Would it be the NHS side of thing, or would it be private companies as you know part of the if you like the jigsaw of, of healthcare support? Yeah, it's it's both. Um, you know, at the moment we we've been developing things um, in stealth mode. It's probably the best way of describing it, and we've been looking at uh, how to create a comprehensive healthcare integration platform based purely on looking at the pain points we've experienced on the provider side and utilizing tech to resolve those 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 problems so we're focusing primar primarily on support for care homes at this point in time and we have a couple of independent hospitals as as well but it's looking at how we reduce the burden on staff in the first instance improve the accuracy of data recording and reducing the manual processes that take up so much of time so that your staff can actually spend more time with your patients, with your residents, as opposed to being bogged down with administrative processes. And that's what we've been working on over the last few years. It's been, yeah, it's been quite a, an interesting journey getting all of that right. Okay. Well, and so who would be paying for that? Would it be care home groups? Or would it be hospitals? Who, who are the actual clients that... Uh... You both. Yeah, both. So um, the um, uh, the care home groups, um, hospitals, um, supported living, dom care. I mean, our, our primary focus, because we've done a lot of work during COVID with um, um, in, in care homes, looking at the elderly side of it. And, and, and my team was involved in a, a step down project, which was a Nightingale project. And that was um, patients from the NHS coming into a special care home um, who had COVID, patients that had COVID prior to taking them back home. And so we've got a lot of experience on that side of it and, and a lot of passion, of course, for dealing with that particular group of, uh, of client service users. Okay. So you mentioned COVID there, Devon. Just stepping out a bit more widely than that, though, more broadly, you know, the, the, the demographics of, of our population the other environmental changes that have, that have taken place over the last uh, few years, uh, clearly the you know, pressures on NHS budgets, et cetera. How have all those environmental trends and dynamics impacted on your industry and your business, would you say? What have been the main impacts? I think with the NHS, what you've found is um, they've obviously been... Um, a need to look at savings, cost savings. And we, we haven't, to be honest with you, we haven't primarily as a group experienced a lot of difficulties. And I put that down to once you've got outstanding ratings and once you're producing excellent care, you, you'll survive in the sector. You know, you have a sustainable business. Mm -hmm. I think there's been more of a focus on looking at um the types of services that are being provided, particularly in, in, in care homes, and whether or not, uh, which I agree with, I, I think a lot of people should be managed and can be managed at home. It's better for them. 
the environment's better for them, and that produces potentially a cost saving for the NHS if you can if you can do that. But the technology isn't there quite yet. So you're looking at how to remotely monitor individuals in their home in order to give them a similar level of care. And that needs to be matched with technology that allows you to, to do that. Mm -hmm. So I think where the NHS is concerned, it seems like there is progression towards that. But you know, when you've got such a massive beast of an organization, progress is often slow. Okay. And what what about the the areas of focus or the overlap between Health Connect and Equilibrium? If you don't mind just sharing a, a few details of, around that, please, Devon. Yeah, sure. So, I mean, very recently, we last week, we announced that we would be developing um, the first Internet of Things service. So that's the first in the world. And that is connecting loads and loads and loads of different devices that would allow you to automate processes. And again, it goes back to the previous point I was making about how do we free up staff time? How do we give them time to spend with people? You know, the human touch. Um, and the only way to do that, Gary, is to automate processes. Uh, it speeds it speeds everything up. It improves the accuracy of data recording, and it reduces. You know, it's just staff. It's difficult dealing with the legacy computer systems that we have. Lots of studies have shown that it creates lots of cognitive burden for staff. So, what you're doing is solving two problems. You, you're removing that cognitive burden, and you're freeing up the time for the staff. So, we've been very fortunate. Uh, because we've had the go ahead for implementing the technology, which is, you know, as I've said, massive to to do, and and it's not the type of project. Uh, but whenever you've, you you're experimenting, and whenever you're looking at prototypes, they're expensive. You know, they are, and they 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 just get cheaper over time. But as I said, you know, the commitment on the equilibrium side is to produce outstanding care. So we we take those risks. Um, look, not everything's going to work. I know that, you know, we're going to have challenges and that's part of being resilient. And whenever you experiment, some experiments fail. But fortunately, we have the backing to do that. And what our hope is and what our aim is, is, is to prove that you can provide a cost-effective way of improving care. And that can be scalable. And if we can do that, if we can evidence it in just the units that we have, then what we have is a blueprint that we could then scale out that other people would get involved in you know we've had a lot of interest around the iot stuff that we that we're doing but obviously we're keeping it very focused and and just doing it at equilibrium at this point in time okay well i appreciate there might be confidential sensitivities here Devin, but it, it, might you be able to share a particular health context in which the the, the benefits would come through um yeah so I'm just thinking about what I'm allowed to share at this point in time, because what, what we want to do is, is is obviously implement stuff and then produce the results. But I could probably give you one good example. Um, one of the common problems that you'd find in, in care homes is, uh, particularly uh, care homes that cater for those in um, late life, is falls, unobserved falls. And you, you, you cannot the, the, manually, unless you're observing everyone all the time, you're always going to have this problem. And an unobserved fall results in a lot of different consequences depending on what, what the outcome of that fall is. But one of the things that we are implementing is a fall detection system that is 99% accurate. Um, now, obviously, we're going to have to test it ourselves with our data. But what this means is that you are no longer manually reliant on observing individuals um, and you will pick up falls. I, can't go much into detail about the actual system at this point in time, but, but you, what you can gauge from that is that uh, the system would immediately alert if a fall has taken place. So you have an immediate alert to stuff, which means the response time is now phenomenally quicker than based on manual observations. As a consequence of that, it means that you can now intervene in a much more timely manner. And then you have all of the um, paperwork that goes with unobserved falls that have now gone because it's been observed and it has been responded to. So that's one example, a practical example of something that's a common problem that we can deal with the system that yeah. we've put in place. Interesting. Make, makes absolute sense. So moving maybe on to the business side, you mentioned some of the technological challenges you have, Devin, but given where you are as a business today and where you're trying to get to, what are, what are the... Uh, 
you know, key challenges you'd say you've got today? I think probably one of the key challenges is um, if I look at it from the healthcare side, it's recruitment. You know, there's there's staffing shortages. We've we've been very fortunate um, in that we have managed to in some of our units maintain full occup. Um, we've been fully recruited, and that comes from what we're creating. You know, that comes from being able to create a culture and environment that people are happy working and they want to be working. People want to be part of something special. You, you're creating something that's the first in the world. You're going to have people wanting to join to be part of that process. But I think following on from that is making sure one of the lessons I've learned is about recruiting the right people. You know, I cannot emphasize enough getting the right team. And that team has to be aligned with the vision, you know, and they have to be passionate about what they do. Fortunately in healthcare, Kerry, most people that work in healthcare are passionate about their jobs. You know, they are passionate about improving the, the lives of others and, and, and see it as a privilege. Mm. So in, in that respect, we're fortunate that we have a group of people that have got values that align to what we want to do. But it's making sure that you can actually attract and retain that right talent. I think that's the biggest challenge for people in our positions going forward. Makes sense. So you mentioned vision there then, David. And what, what are the... If you like the aspirations, where do you see the business in, say, three to five years' time, and and how kind of different is that from from where you are today? Uh, completely different. Uh, I, <laughs> I think in the next, you know, we, we're hopeful that we'll be able to pull the first part off in the next six months and prove, um, that, and prove that you can automate and prove that you can you can remove reduce manual processes and and improve care tremendously. You know, there's there's numerous examples of what we're going to be implementing. So I see the business as changing completely towards one where tech is at the heart of everything that we do. Everything from the recording of data, the analysis of data, the observations that we spoke about earlier, you, you can automate almost everything. And I see these facilities as being facilities that are gonna be very tech heavy. Just sticking on the older age uh, side for a moment, if you look at what the future of care homes entails, if you go back 15, 20 years, the technology that people were using in their day-to-day -day lives um, was, was quite minuscule, but that's completely changed. So now what we've got to do is cater for a population that are actually tech savvy. People that are going to be utilizing these homes in the next five to 10 years are actually quite a fay with tech. And you've got to incorporate that into your facilities. Very good, okay. So what about um, what you've learned as a, a business owner and a business leader then, Devon? Arguably the uh, the most important bit, bit of this discussion. You, you, you reflected a little bit on uh, you know the importance of having vision to get, get the recruitment right, et cetera. But what else might be top of your list of, of key reflections and lessons. If you were starting it all over again, what advice would you give yourself? That's a great question. Um, I think the first point, which is the emphasis on building a team, um, that would be my first point. And I think having a team that has a, a unified vision, selling that vision to that team, because even though you can have a team that possesses exceptional talent, they still have to share and deliver on that vision. And the right people carry out the foundation of any successful endeavor. So what you've got to look for is you've got to make sure that you've got people that are not just talented, but also deeply committed to what you are trying to achieve and who might not see, who might not themselves see the full picture and, and, and aren't going to be thinking five, 10 years ahead, but have belief in the leadership. And, and, and we'll follow that. Um, I think the other bit that sticks out for me is culture, absolutely culture, and creating and fostering a culture of openness. But I'd add to that constructive criticism. Because um, that, what that does is set you up for the fact that you will always have trouble you, in these services, you'll always get complaints, and it's learning to deal with them in a particular way and dealing with them constructively. Mm -hmm. The um, if you want people to be creative and and and, and innovative and and you want them to thrive, then it has to be in an an environment where ideas can be challenged and refined, 
And you got to do that without ego of failure or, or fear of failure. And I think if you do that and you create a particular culture that's going to encourage open dialogue, um, embrace this failure as a stepping stone to success and innovation, then what you've done is, is, is you've created an environment that will nurture creativity and breakthroughs. Um, and one final point, which, which I, I will admit I have been terrible at personally, but it is creating that balance, that balance between that work life and personal life. And, and, you know, you'll hear lots of people that have been very successful talk about the number of hours you've got to put in and how you've got to be completely motivated, focused and spending all of your time doing doing the work stuff. I, I don't I don't agree with that. I don't think that balance means compromising on ambition or achievements at all. I think it's just integrating your pursuits with a healthy perspective on a work-life balance. And you get far more out of your teams if you're able to do that. And that's probably one of the things I didn't do very well when I started. I think what we've got to do as leaders is make sure that we put in the mechanisms for our staff to actually achieve that, not just about saying it. And actually that becomes part of your work structure, creating that balance for them. Mm. Yeah, some great reflections there. So balance, culture and teamwork. What you're saying about culture there reminds me, I don't know whether you're familiar with Kim Scott's work, Radical Candor. It's the name, no, of, the name no. of her book. I certainly reckon it sounded like it would really resonate with you. So she talks that about the idea of combining caring personally for your team, but at the same time challenging directly. Yeah. And yeah. that's really the, um, the kind of background to creating a culture whereby you uh, you can be radically candid with everybody in, in a context of support and challenge. So uh, that 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 could be one for your for your book list. Whilst, whilst I will I will whilst... definitely I will definitely read that. The, the the one that resonated when you said that there was um, Simon Sinek. He um, he described one of the things he says about leaders is that leadership isn't about being in charge, but making sure that you take care of the people in your charge, and that is where that balance comes in and doing everything in your capacity to actually take care of those people. But now I will definitely read that book. I, I love reading books about culture. Yeah, well, um, I'll definitely recommend um, J uh, James Kerr's book, Legacy. I don't know whether you're interested in, in rugby at all, but it, does, it doesn't really matter whether you are or whether you aren't. It's still a, a great lead, and it refers to actually to a lot of other books. Uh, but it's what the All Blacks can te teach us about business leadership, but, but it really is focused on... Uh, developing culture but the, the other thing that sprang to mind as you said that Devin was one of my favorite Simon Sinek's book was um you know speaking a little bit to what you just said and that is uh, as a leader all he needed one thing followers <laughs> <laughs> so how do you create people that, that follow you because they want to follow you not not because uh, you're their boss so uh yeah that's one of my favorite Simon Sinek quotes very good well it's been great to hear uh, about your 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 journey Devin one one last question if I may please um in terms of anybody who might be interested in connecting with you or having a follow-up discussion whether it's a potential recruit or, or potentially in the uh, uh on the kind of client side of things what what do you suggest as a sensible next step um Probably LinkedIn is one of the quickest ways to get a hold of me. Uh, I'd be happy to share my um, uh, my contact details with you when you're sending this out. Um, and I'll, I can send through my email address for people that want to connect. Okay. Very good. Well, we will definitely add that to the posts that come out with this video. Uh, and once again, many, many thanks for your time, your input, and sharing your pearls of wisdom. And all the very best with Equilibrium and Health Connect. Thank you very much and my pleasure. Thank you so much for having me on. All the best. Bye for now.